Now it's red? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, this is a set of two lectures and um, to what we'll be doing today is um, we're going to talk about these learning goals, the basics of cryptography, and what Oscar will be doing next week is building on top of that. He will go into a lot more detail on how specifically uh, PKI works, public key, cryptography, uh, infrastructure, um, TLS, I don't really like to use the term SSL anymore, and um, how this is used in practice. There is a set of uh, very important workshop assignments that go along with this lecture and Oscar's lecture as well. I strongly urge you to make them and to make them for yourself. Um, I was just, uh, I was having a word with Earshot about the uh, workshop assignments for this week. We actually took out some of the assignments because they are uh, a bit too heavy on the math, I feel. Um, we're making an exception from one of these things. Earshot will tell you more about this. Um, that is to say, um, we won't ask you to make them, but if you do know uh, your masks, please by all means try and make the assignments we've left out. Uh, it will give you a good grounding in how cryptography works. Uh, what the math, uh, basically uh, what the underpinning math is in this case. It, uh, it can be pretty daunting if you do it for, for the first time, but it is quite useful. And um, like I said, uh, Oscar, it, it's also very useful for Oscars lecture, if you already know a little bit about this. So we're going to talk about cryptography and crypto cryptographic tools. So um, what is the point of cryptography? <coughs> Before I start with this slides, with the actual slide deck, my first question is actually to you. What is the whole point of doing cryptography and encryption? Um, yes? Uh, keeping secrets? That's actually... Uh, Keeping secrets, yeah. Uh, usually, if, uh, usually you do want to uh, disclose them to some other party, but you can fine-tune that statement a bit. But okay, I'll grant you that one. Keeping secrets, but there's another point. Protect data. What? Protect data from yeah, that's roughly the same. Protecting data, keeping secrets. There's another idea behind cryptography and cryptographic algorithms. Confidentiality, uh, yeah, maintaining confidentiality is once again the same thing. There's a, but there is something else for which cryptography and cryptographic algorithms are used. It's not just about making stuff unreadable to whoever you don't want it to read. It's about something else as well, yes. To ensure that the data that is only uh, readable for the person it's distant to? It's still keeping secrets, in fact. Yeah, and we'll, we will see, uh, it, it, it'll come up in the presentation, but if I say the word hashing as a hint, does that ring a bell? It's what is it used for? Compared to values? Mm, okay. Well, the other thing about cryptography is that it's quite useful to do authentication. You can use cryptography not just to hide stuff from other people and preferably uh, share data only within the confines of the set of people you wanted to see or systems you wanted to access and so on. The whole point is also that you can verify that the data is correct. It is also used for, in, in, uh, you might have heard of it, uh, PGP, anyone using it? Yeah. I am, yes. <coughs> and I was hoping someone else noticed so far, but so far there's only been one student who has tried to exchange public keys with me. Only one, <laughs> which was a bit disappointing. But uh, the, the whole point of uh, PGP is that you, don't, you, you can't only use it for encryption, that is to say I can send someone an encrypted email, they can read it, decrypt it, and so on. But it's also used to verify that it's really, really me sending this message. It's like putting your signature. That's why they're called digital signatures. So that's also why we use cryptography. So, um, 
<coughs> the most common form of encryption is this, symmetric encryption. And uh, why is it symmetric? <coughs> really simple, uh, simple actually. Um, I'll skip one slide ahead for that. Look very closely at this part, reverse of encryption algorithm. So you have one algorithm, you cram some data into it, some other stuff comes rolling out, hopefully un completely unreadable and doesn't mean anything. And you take that, you have the same key, and you do the whole thing in reverse, and then the original text comes out. That's why it's symmetric, simple key, that's all. Simplified model of symmetric encryption, remember that. So um, it's very common, and we use it a lot. Does anyone know any examples of symmetric uh, crypto cryptographic algorithms? Really a tongue twister, that one. Uh, AES. AES, yes. Quite common these days, based on uh, work by Reindahl. Other examples? Sure. Actually, that's a hashing algorithm. That's not symmetric encryption. There are more than just AES. No? DES? The predecessor? 3DES? No? No bells ringing? Okay. Um, well, I would say uh, read up on them. There are quite a few and they all have different advantages and disadvantages. So AES is a good example. It's, it, it's in widespread use. Um, whether it will remain in widespread use is a different issue altogether. There have been strong uh, pushes, especially by cryptographic experts, to move to uh, elliptic curve. Ellipt well, I really have problems pronouncing these things today. Elli elliptic curve cryptography, uh, particularly by notable cryptographers such as uh, Daniel Bernstein and Tanya Lange, who work at the uh, University of Eindhoven. Um, and with good reason, actually. Uh, but it, it will take a while. It's it, much like the transition we had from DES to AES. It will take a while and a lot of time and similarly money and investment and so on before we've moved to these new kinds of encryption. So we'll see. And AES for most intents and purposes still is perfectly sufficient. Um, symmetric encryption, encryption and I don't know why it specifically says that on this slide. Of course, for any kind of encryption, you would like to have a strong encryption algorithm. The stronger the encryption algorithm, and what does strong mean, the harder it is to break in any particular way, either with any different method. It, it's, it's either extremely difficult uh, in the sense that it, it takes a lot of computation or um, it, it's so big that the, um, finding the actual key that was used, it, it's all about time, pretty much. The whole point. Okay, so, um, obviously, as you saw on the next slide, it assumes that you have some kind of secret key that you agree on. Alice and Bob are the common parties we talk about when we talk about encryption. Um, have this secret key, only they know it, hopefully. And they are using it to crypt and decrypt the text. And generally, we have the term plain text, cipher text, and hopefully on the other end, we have plain text again. <coughs> so I assume this is completely clear, what this does. But don't worry, there's not a lot of detail in these slides about how uh, all this works under the hood. But I would, once again, I would strongly recommend that if you do have the chance, look into it. It's not that hard once you get to uh, uh, the d deep down uh, workings of it, but it is a bit time consuming if you have to figure it out by hand. Luckily we have computers that are good at this. So what can you do to break this encryption? And I already gave you a hint when I said something about time. It's nearly uh, that you can do it in two general ways. You can just try brute forcing things, which means you basically uh, try every possible key until you figure out what the original text is. But there are a bit, uh, there are several problems with this approach. What are the problems with the approach? It takes really long. 
It takes really long. Well, that depends, of course, on the strength of the encryption. But you have to be lucky. Yeah, you have to be lucky. It's a question of time. It can take exceedingly long. Um, so, <coughs> when we talk about uh, symmetric encryption, and someone said something about AES, um, what is the size of a uh, the key used, because what you're doing is you're trying to brute force, you're trying to guess the, the key. 256, I believe that. Yeah, it can be 256, there are actually several valid answers, AES can have many key lengths, 128, 64 even. I believe that is kind of the recommended. Yeah, they recommend at least AES 128, and there are actually a, a, a good colleague of mine who does a lot of cryptanalysis in France, um, did some research into it and it actually turns out that if you go to very small key sizes with AES, which you can do actually, uh, there are some interesting inher inherent weaknesses in AES. And um, they're not exactly, sh I, I don't know what the current state of affairs is, but um, uh, when they started scaling up the key size and it took progressively longer to do the analysis, but these weaknesses did not disappear. So they still have a suspicion that there are some inherent weaknesses even at larger key sizes. This was all way above my understanding of the math behind it. So please don't approach me and start asking me questions. I don't know the answer. Uh, but it is interesting and um, there's a lot of uh, 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 conspiracy theorists out there that say, well this was why the NSA wanted everyone to use Rheindahl, AES. Because they knew this and they have the keys to the castle secretly and they know how to crack it and so on. Okay. But yeah, it depends on the key size and it can take a long while. So let's for instance say we have a 256 bit key. We're uh, all happy TrueCrypt users, of course. And we've done full disk encryption and we have 256 bit, six bit keys. So how many different keys are there in that case? You don't have to give me an exact number. Two, to the power of two yes. Once again. Two to the power of yeah, two to the power of 256, and that's an astronomically large number. Really, that's within a completely unreasonable amount of possible keys, and it gets worse because it will take you, on average, half of that. So that's 2 to the power of what? 255. 255, thank you. Someone said 128, there's always one. 2 to the power of 255 of those before you, on average, statistically speaking, before you found the actual key. There's another problem with this approach, brute force. And it's more subtle. It's not on the slide. You need the hardware? No, that's just the same thing. It takes time. But let's say we have a small key size. Oh. Some algorithms are designed to be slow. Some algorithms are designed to be slow. That's still the, the time argument. And that's more on the left. That's more of a, a cryptanalytic attack. There, there's a bigger problem with this. It assumes that you can recognize the plain text for what it is. Do you understand what I mean with that? If you do brute forcing, you are assuming that you know what the plain text was supposed to look like. If that was random data to begin with, useless. So it's, it's a even a little bit more difficult, difficult than that. So, um, but there are uh, real and real world approaches to doing this brute force. and. Uh, there are specifically particular uh, hardware devices that are very good and can be used because you can do this in parallel, of course, guessing all these keys. So what kind of hardware is pop commonly used to do this work? GPUs. GPUs, graphic cards, and there are even specially made graphic cards that aren't really graphic cards anymore that are used to do this kind of attacks, just sort of key guessing. Uh, you can even hire ser this as a service online. You <laughs> push in uh, a nice dump of the uh, Windows passwords and so on. It's not symmetric in encryption in that case, but <coughs> you dump in the hashed passwords and they start brute force guessing. 
for you and it costs you a certain amount of money and then you get uh, passwords that work. Um, but brute forcing, yeah, it, it's possible sometimes. There's also cryptanalytic attacks and um, there's one uh, type of attack that's not listed on the slide but I will get to that later. Um, in that case you're relying on the nature of the algorithm. At the end of the line uh, encryption is still <coughs> you decide on a certain set of actions that you do to get from the plain text to the cipher text. Cipher text. So if the um, algorithm itself is really really crappy because the way it generates a key is very predictable or for whatever reason then, and we'll see an example of that actually when we get to ECB, um, it might still be very easy to guess what the key was. So it also assumes that the actual encryption algorithm used is very well made. It's not that simple. So, um, <coughs> regardless of what you do, uh, it, once you have this key, this secret key, as it says uh, down below, you can decrypt everything that was encrypted with that key. Um, luckily there are also ways around that, and I'm sure Oscar will tell you more about this. We now have a thing called perfect forward secrecy, which you can use to make sure that you have different keys for every session you have and then it's suddenly no longer possible to use previous keys to decrypt the next stuff or vice or in reverse. So um, someone uh, said AES, I already mentioned DES and triple DES. These are still in widespread use unfortunately, DES and triple DES and as you can see if you realize that these were made many many years ago these encryption algorithms, they were thought of and, and, and implemented. You might think, well, <coughs> it was secure. And it actually was at the time. It was a good idea. But they weren't stupid. They, they, of course they knew they could do bigger key sizes and so on. Why didn't they do that? Yes, in the back once again. I will repeat it, yes? Oh, sorry. Uh, it takes longer to decrypt and encrypt. <coughs> yeah, it, it, the amount of processing power that is needed increases as well. And if you think about, well, if it was 20 years ago, the processing power that we have in our phone now is uh, m maybe a, a thousand or a million times as much as the computers back then. It's progress for you. But that also has the unfortunate problem that and uh, more detail later, but then we have the unfortunate problem that it becomes easier to attack these things as well. If we have more processing power, it becomes more and more feasible to brute force these algorithms. So, they weren't stupid. They thought, well, we'll move on from this and we'll start doing triple this to increase the key length. So, um, <coughs> this is old. It's not really a uh, too complex, um, but I would, uh, uh, once again, um, there's not a lot of detail on how these encryption algorithms actually work in the slides, but by all means you can just find the specifications for them. They are public knowledge and they have been approved by public organizations and so on. So you can find out how they work and they're not that complex, these old ones. And even AES is not that difficult, it's rather even, even in cryptographic terms, AES is rather old. So read up and <coughs> see if you understand how they work. So the, um, <coughs> when this, at one point it was commonplace and for a long time uh, uh, actually a 56-bit keys was a restriction that the US government had on exports, uh, export algorithms and so on. There was a lot of uh, hubbub about that. They even tried to jail someone named Phil Zimmerman. Any, uh, anyone familiar with that name? For offering encryption that had bigger key lengths than that? No? Okay. Really time to read up then. And <coughs> at one point they realized it and it was the Electronic Fr Frontier Foundation, very important organization that fights for, uh, fights for your rights online, that they announced that they had broken deaths just by brute forcing. 
and it's what, it, this was, uh, well, 17 years ago. So even then it became feasible. People were starting to notice that it was within the realm of possibility that you could start breaking this. And you have to realize this is a public organization, EFF, and they do it, the chance that they are doing it with commodity hardware, so let's say a server you and I could buy, or even in a company, is probably a good assumption. Now you have to realize that if we're all using this encryption, I can guarantee you that the actual NSA and the governments of around the world have better hardware and specialized hardware to do this. So, and they knew this for quite a while. So they were actu undoubtedly actively doing this, brute forcing this. So there was a strong push for better encryption already. So what they came up with triple DES to increase the key length. So 3 times 56 is 168 to increase the key length. You can see the reason they did that. If you look at the time that is needed, if you do, what is it, 10 to the 13th, so that's a million, billion, trillion, 10 trillion in uh, American uh, English. So that's, uh, in our case, it's a billion in Dutch, <coughs> 10 billion, <coughs> which is pretty reasonable. You can do that with normal hardware. You can see how long it would take you to crack this, just by brute force. In other words, not long at all. And you can see how quickly the decryption time increases. And uh, this was the, uh, like I said pre when I asked previously, so if you uh, have to search half the key space, how much uh, decryptions have you done? And someone said 2 to 128th. Be careful, it's dividing by 2. It only means that you subtract 1 from the exponent here. It's, it starts increasing exponentially the time that is needed to crack this, if you're brute forcing things. <coughs> and I think... In the case of AES, uh, I think the universe will probably end before you've brute forced it. So that brings me to another point. Um, rather than trying to brute force things, it is often far more att attractive and smart to do this. See if you can find a weakness in the either the algorithm or the thing that is not listed on the sheet, the implementation. So, who of you have used Debian for quite a while? Debian Linux? And which of you actually have an idea of where I'm going with this? There was a, quite a, a big, uh, well, I won't use the word, a big um, storm around Debian because of a cryptographic problem. Does anyone know what, what I'm talking about? It turned out that uh, the implementation Debian had used for quite a while, I believe it was the random number generator that was used in its cryptography or, or for some of its uh, certificates or something, was actually quite weak and predictable. What was supposed to be random, randomly generated numbers, and we'll get into that later as well, was actually not that random at all, which means it became predictable and if the creation of secret keys, etc., is predictable, then you can significantly narrow this, the key space that you need here. You can significantly decrease the amount of keys you have to search to. And that is really attractive. So who of you reads XKCD? I'm very disappointed. XKCD, the stick figure comic by Randall Munro. It should be on your standard reading list. XKCD.com slash 538. I know that one for, by heart now. Look at it. But it's a good example of why it's often, it's, it's of course exaggerated for the, uh, uh, because it's supposed to be funny, but that's the, that's one of the most important things people often forget. You can have the idea, oh, we have such a great key space, and, but if you, de if the way you implement this algorithm is very crappy, uh, or you use bad RAM number generators and so on, etc. Then the attack, 
the most likely point of attack just shifts. And this, of course, uh, there are lots of people who are constantly looking for weaknesses to this. And you see this not just with symmetric uh, encryption, I've mentioned that previously as well. If you look at public key, key cryptography and the whole system of certificate authorities, you have the same issues. There have been uh, problems where malware was using uh, uh, the certificates owned by Microsoft, old certificates that were signed with weak hashing, they would brute force this whole system, they would brute force the signature, etc. You can forget about that now. But basically what the malware creators could do with that is issue malware that was signed correctly as if it was using that certificate by Microsoft and therefore looked like it was a legitimate piece of software. And Windows would not complain, it would happily install this and so on. So this is a, always a problem and it was not necessarily that the uh, um, that they needed to uh, brute forces, but the implementation, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the algorithm behind it, MD5 in this case, is so well known and it's become so easy to brute force it and to attack it specifically and to guess what the correct input would be to get the desired output, that it became feasible to do that for them. So Microsoft had to revoke that certificate. And this has happened before. Okay, so uh, triple deaths, as I mentioned previously, they did it uh, because they wanted to increase the key length. Um, <coughs> for some reason they've mentioned that the underlying encryption algorithm is the same as this as an attraction. It's not necessarily an attraction, of course, uh, but there are some notable drawbacks. The block size is limited. That also has an effect on the feasibility of cracking it in uh, whichever way. And um, it is very sluggish to do this in software. That also has to do with the key length, which is a very unfortunate 168 bits. Not easy to calculate with. Um, so, well, it is in use, but it never really caught on. So they needed a good replacement a real replacement, rather, for triple DES encryption. <coughs> so, what the uh, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and uh, if you're not familiar with that organization, also look them up. They do a lot of work, and they set a lot of standards for uh, the government, for instance, for governments in plural, actually. Um, NIST.gov, and um, what they did was they uh, wanted to have an advanced encryption standard, and they came. Uh, uh, these were the requirements that they had. I already mentioned that there are more than uh, the key sizes, uh, more key sizes uh, to AES than just 256 bit. You can see some examples here. <coughs> Larger data, blocks uh, needed to be symmetric, much improved efficiency. That is to say, why did they want to have improved efficiency? And what do they mean with efficiency in this case? Probably the encryption time? Yeah. The, the, the amount of processing power needed to be reduced, which was of course logical if it was meant to replace DES. But with DES it was a problem, and with AES uh, they wanted to have uh, things that were easy to implement without lo uh, endangering the cryptographic quality, the strength of the algorithm. <coughs> and of course, better than 3DES, obviously. So. Um, it took quite a while and eventually, and I already mentioned it, all the conspiracy theorists say uh, that it was all shady and good God and the world is coming to an end because we're all using uh, Rijndaal now. Um, Bruce Schneier, anyone familiar with him? No. Also no. A very famous uh, uh, internet personality and gives a lot of lectures, very famous. If you don't know him, read up on him as well. He was also involved in this at the time. He's also a very good cryptographer. <coughs> um, he was also involved in this. He came up with uh, algorithms like Blowfish, if I remember correctly. You might have heard of it. And Toofish, which were also contenders, I believe, at the time. And at the end, they selected Rijndaal. And uh, I think Bruce Snyder is uh, not one of those conspiracy nuts, but he also 
um, uh, because he's a very good cryptographer, I believe he was one of the people who also voiced his concerns about some parts of AES. In practice, um, we haven't really seen any viable attacks yet on AES, but you can't prove what you can't see. You can't prove a negative, so we don't know. Um, eventually, it was accepted as a standard, therefore, as this is the uh, way we're going by NIST. And, well, we're still using it today. So, um, as you can see, they did eventually come up with something that was really suited for long-term use. Okay, so, um, <coughs> what symmetric encryption is about is um, you take data, you chop it into blocks, and you encrypt each of these blocks. And, uh, th of course, it is uh, not that frequent that you only have data that is 64 or 128 bit blocks in size. So you need to encrypt a whole stream of data, or a lot of these blocks. And uh, the simplest approach of doing, uh, to, this, to doing this, these multiple blocks, is using ECB, electronic code books. Just imagine, think about a code book in general, and this is just the electronic version of it. So you take a block of plain text, you encrypt it using the same key, uh, but there is a problem with that. What you get out of that is still predictable. Much like a code book, if you have a code book and you keep using the same code book over and over and the same input keeps giving you the same output over and over, you can still start to deduce patterns. Does anyone, everyone understand that? So um, they came up with um, uh, uh, alternate ways of doing that, symmetric encryption, such as used in AES and so on, uh, where you don't have this problem for large sequences of data. And I will show you why ECB, this simple ECB, is so extremely dangerous. And there have been... Um, now, look at this first. This is the problem. It's one of my favorite pictures to illustrate the problem as well. Not because of the penguin, but you see the weakness with ECB here. And it is literally a picture encrypted with ECB. It's, uh, it's actually from a, a famous, I think someone uh, a famous uh, did a whole blog post of uh, comparing all the different encryption algorithms and taking a picture, encrypting it using all these algorithms and then showing what the result was. So what he did was take picture, Encrypt it, just replace it so the headers would work again. Make it work as a picture and show what it looked like. So, <clears throat> you can see what the weakness is. If you see these patterns, you can start guessing what the key was and get back to the original picture. Or you have at least an idea of where you... Once again, this narrows the key space that you have to look through. So why is, this, why is it so easy to attack this ECB mode? Let's say, for instance, we're not dealing with a picture, but with normal data on a given computer system, a normal distribution of data on a, an everyday laptop. Why is ECB then still so dangerous to use? Yes? Yes, it's predictable. What is predictable? Can you expand on that? Because you're, you're in the right area, but why is the predictability still a problem? What kind of patterns would you expect to see still? You have a limited amount of keys you, are, you can use. Uh, actually, not necessarily a problem there. It's not really the, the amount of keys, but... If it's you have the same sign, it's going to have the same pattern or the same shade. And then you can figure out, okay, this is the oh. same thing. So then you compare it. Like the alpha, for example, if you have A everywhere, right? Then you're going to see a different child. Okay. Um, I, I'm, uh, do you mean that uh, literally an A, a letter A? No, no, like if this is a plain text, right? And then you encrypt it. So then you can see that there are, there are 24 of uh, the letters in the alphabet, right? So then you can compare it. There's going to be 24 shadows, probably. I don't know. We actually have 26. <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> that's okay. We'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> It's uh, no, um, but that's actually uh, that's actually exactly the answer I was hoping for. That's the predictability. So you were in the right area. There are still going to be text, and lots of text in usually predictable places on a computer. 
which means that if you know these texts and you see the patterns, because if you, if you start looking for text you will expect to see it's a distribution of certain values. So if you start looking for the same distribution even though it's encrypted, and that's why this picture still looks remarkably like the original, you're going to find out this is most likely going to be text, which means you're going to, you only have to search a very narrow key space to figure out what the original text was, and you will know it's text because you can understand it once you've successfully decrypted it, you will recognize it as such, and from there on you know the key, and it becomes trivial to decrypt the rest. So, exactly. That is the problem with ECB. Okay, so um, we have block and stream ciphers. Uh, block means you do exactly what was in the previous slide. You take a block of data of a certain size, one block of elements, and you de uh, encrypt them or decrypt them. You get an output block for each input block. You can re you reuse the keys and these are quite common. There's also stream ciphers and they do uh, it, uh, any, they do the same thing, it's uh, still encryption, but they don't work with blocks, they proce process literally like a stream of data, everything continuously. So, a byte or an element at a time. Um, these are faster, easier to implement, etc. Um, can you say anything about the strength of either one? Is block or stream better? Can you say anything about the strength? Anyone at all? They're all silent. Can you say anything about the strength? The answer is really simple. Yes? Uh, perhaps the block cipher is more predictable because it's certain blocks at the same time or something? Actually the answer is no. It doesn't make a difference. You can't say anything about the strength. That's, a, that's up to, that depends on the algorithm that's being used. If you use a really cra crappy block cipher algorithm or no encryption at all, you have a fantastic block cipher but it doesn't do anything. It, it doesn't work like that. It, not, one is not necessarily better than the other. Um, it's mostly about uh, what, what you use them for and uh, the overhead that they have and so on. So. Um, this is something I asked you all the way at the start of the lecture. It's also being used for authentication cryptography. Don't forget that part. And a lot of the um, uh, uh, information that Oscar will be giving you in the guest lecture next week will be about public key infrastructure. And the whole point of public key infrastructure is in large part authentication of the data that's being exchanged. Think about the certificate authorities I mentioned previously. That's all about you going to a website most of the time that says HTTPS in front of it and it has one of those nice green locks or blue locks. There doesn't really, there's not a huge difference between the two. But it, that's proof that the person or the entity you're communicating with is really who they say they are, who they claim to be. That's also where encryption is very, very important. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so um, methods, message authentication, we're not going to uh, jump through all these uh, <coughs> things in too much detail. But the idea is, is that you, use, uh, you, you share some information which allows you, you and the other party, to confirm that the information you're receiving really comes from them or vice versa, that your information you send, that you can prove it was really you that sent it. So, um, <coughs> and a lot of this is about hashing. And hashing is something completely different from encryption. The, the whole idea behind it, using algorithms to change the data in something, uh, into something unreach, uh, unreadable and decrypted, does not apply to hashing. I'm exaggerating here. There are, there are some there's some overlap in the ideas, but hashing is one way, and one way only. More explicitly, an ideal hashing algorithm, hash algorithm, or hashing algorithm, is so good that it is 
always one way and there's no way to figure out what the original was. But there's a problem with that and we'll get into that. Um, the whole point of hashing is that you can uh, give it any data you want of any size, you run the algorithm over it and it produces a fixed length, depending on the hash you're using, it gives you a fixed length output and this output is as unique as possible, once again we'll get, I'll get into that, it's as unique as possible for the input you gave it, the output. <coughs> There's a problem, and it starts already here, it produces a fixed length output. And we can give it any, as you can see, a block of data of any size. Yet it produces a fixed length output depending on the hashing algorithm. So let's say the hashing algorithm says that there's a, the result is a 32 bit or 64 bit or whatever, uh, a 160 bit value that comes rolling out of it at the end. We have 2 to the power of 160 different values. But let's say we have a weaker hashing algorithm which only produces a 64-bit value, it doesn't really matter in this example. <coughs> that means there's only going to be 2 to the power of 64 different hashes possible. It's a fixed length. So, so what can you deduce from that? I see saw someone raising their hand, yes? There will be collisions at a certain point. Uh, and what is a collision? In this case, well, two, two products with the same hash, which are actually different in content. Yeah, you sooner or later, or for any hashing algorithm, you're going to end up with two inputs that give you the same <coughs> hash as output. So in this, that is why they're completely different, and one way because you're actually throwing away data, whichever way you look at it, when you com compute the hash. And a collision is, in that case, literally, it, it, uh, it's not really two things crashing into each other, but a collision in hashing means that two inputs give you the same hash as output, two different inputs. Yes? That's also why MD5 is not safe anymore, because it was possible to compute uh, two different, um, well, with, with a certain, uh, how do you say, it? content that was readable and printable, um, but actually have the same hashes. Right. Yeah, for MD5 the, the amount of possible hashes is now so small compared to the power of modern computers that it's easy to, uh, to calculate a collision. So you have completely different inputs but it will give you the same output. And there's another problem with MD5 actually. The algorithm behind it is uh, there have been, uh, there's been a lot of cryptanalysis done on MD5 and it's actually uh, not that hard these days to change the input you have in such a way so you don't, for instance you want to have like I said some kind of malware that looks uh, like it's a legit program not because the coding changes but you want to have it generate uh, a valid hash for whatever reason you can, there's, there's simple uh, uh, programs that will slightly change or pad the program that you have which, because they know the algorithm so that it will exactly match the desired hash you can slightly have it automatically modified until the hash matches for MD5 and it's actually becoming uh, feasible, feasible to do this with SHA-1 as well which is why they're pushing for SHA-256 now at the very least or other hashing algorithms, Whirlpool, uh, RMD and so on they're pushing very hard for different hashing algorithms because this is a problem um, and um, uh, I actually mentioned this previously, there's a, the problem that a lot of certificates used to be signed with MD5 and SHA-1 hashes in the past and these are also becoming vulnerable. Why this is, of course, Oscar will tell you more next week, but that's also a problem and for instance uh, if, you're, uh, if you're involved with academia and surfnet, they're pushing very hard to get all these certificates that have been issued with SHA-1 to be replaced with new certificates that have been uh, signed with better hashing algorithms. 
as a result. So that's a collision in hashing, hashing and it's a real world danger. Okay, so um, <coughs> I already mentioned it. Um, you can actually try to find weaknesses in the algorithm. Cryptanalysis. This uh, cryptanalysis is also just as applicable to symmetric encryption or any other, uh, any kind of encryption algorithm you can do cryptanalysis on and try to figure out what the weaknesses are. Um, you can brute force it. Once again, a uh, good example. Uh, it used to be that uh, MD5 was actually quite easily brute forceable, but there's been so much cryptanalysis that there are more intelligent tools now that will help you get the desired collision. Um, SHA is luckily now the most widely used one, fortunately. It's, um, you have to realize that this is pervasive in the world. And what I, I meant previously, what it's in use everywhere. SHA is also being used, luckily salted, but it's also being used to store the hashes of passwords on Unix systems. So if, there are, uh, if they find weaknesses in these cryptographic hash functions, the impact is enormous. If they find some magical magic bullet, that's very rare, but uh, some, some way of making uh, calculating collisions <coughs> quick, feasible and easy, the, uh, well, the attack surface is massive because it's used everywhere. So, um, <coughs> it already says it, you see, hash of password is stored by an operating system. So why do, uh, actually uh, there were, um, why do operating systems store hashes? And there were actually operating systems and implementations of the uh, password facilities that used symmetric encryption in the past, like this. Why are they using hashes? The system doesn't need to retrieve your <coughs> password. Once you, uh, he receives your password, or yeah. you enter it, he can just calculate the hash and see if it's the same. Exactly, because there's an, uh, that's a, an ex example of why not, by, but you, you already said it in the first sentence. There's absolutely no reason why the operating system would need to know the original password. When it needs, to, uh, when the operating system at uh, or any service on the system, the only thing it needs to do, in the worst possible scenario, which is it needs to figure out if the password was correct, all it needs to do is take the password that has, that someone has provided or some service has provided, run the hashing algorithm over it, and s compare it to the one stored. You should never store pla passwords in an encrypted form, only in a hashed form. And, or even worse, plain text. I, it always surprises me that when uh, there, there's a lot of even telecom providers to this day, if you use the password recovery function, they happily send you your password over email and in an unencrypted form. I can't for the life of me imagine uh, who works there and who thought that was a good idea. But it's, it, it's painful to see that. And it still happens. There's no reason for it. <coughs> Um, okay, but hashing is nice for many other things. Like I said, it's very pervasive, and it's being this whole concept is being used everywhere. Um, there are uh, uh, intrusion detection systems such as Tripwire that will that you can configure to watch a set of files or all files or whatever on your system, and what they do is they calculate the hashes of these files. And when an intrusion occurs and one of these files is modified, that's the whole point, the hash will change. And then these systems can generate an alert, look the file has changed and of course you need to react to that or uh, you can have automated reactions depending on, uh, either way there needs to be a reaction to deal with the problem. So that's also why they're useful. Okay, so I'll not go, uh, we'll take a short break and then we'll go on with PKI. Could you pause the recording for me? We'll continue in 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, so welcome back. Um, public key encryption structure. Um, it's a very, uh, uh, very general overview, as I mentioned previously. Um, Oscar will go into a lot more detail on this. And there will also be practical uh, practical things that you will do, a workshop associated with this. <coughs> so, um, the 
idea of public key encryption is really old. As you can see, 1976, Diffie and Hellman, and these are names that you will see today, Diffie-Hellman encryption, etc. Um, it's all still math underneath, obviously. Um, the, the point of uh, public key encryption is, once again, you use it for two things. You use it for encryption, secrecy, and for authentication. And if we're talking about uh, HTTPS, uh, Usually it's the combination of the two. There's both the encryption going on, HTTPS, and the verification that you're talking to the right party, the authentication part. So remember that. Um, this is a, an important point. Um, some form of protocol is needed for distribution of the public keys. Uh, we have, for PGP, we have key servers that we use. If you haven't set up PGP and you would like to, I, uh, I really like it when students set that up. That is to say, um, if there's enough, enough of you who are interested, I'm willing to host a key signing party, as it's called. Um, <clears throat> and for, uh, uh, but in some way you need to be able to exchange these public keys and verify uh, where they're coming from and so on. So what is the idea? Look at this uh, uh, very general picture again. The explanation of the terms is here. Once again, we speak about uh, a plain text and a cipher text. Nothing different there. And you have a public and private key. The important thing to remember is that the <coughs> public keys are public for a reason. They are supposed to be for everyone to see and use. Private keys, where does a private key belong? Well, that's the problem. You can't have it locked away. Well, I There's only I one place where the private key is supposed to be. In your possession. And I've, I've had, uh, over the past year, I've had people send me their private keys as well. <laughs> I wish I could instantly grade something as fail for that, a class, but... If, if, if you do that, if, some, if at some point your private key comes out, uh, you immediately need to revoke the thing. And all the work starts over. New private key, every, new public private key pair, all the signing needs to be done again. It has become useless at that point. And uh, if depending on uh, some other factors, all the encrypted things that have happened in the past might also be decrypted with it. So be very, very careful what you do with your private key. This is the reason that we have these nice little devices that we can take with us and have on us at all times that are used to store these. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if someone wants to send another person an encrypted message, in this case, Bob is sending Alice, so Bob is sending Alice an encrypted message. Bob uses his private key to encrypt the message. And like I said, I'm not going to go into the implementation, even though it's not that difficult, but um, the idea is, is that anyone who has Bob's public key can decrypt the message. So in this case, Alice only needs to have Bob's public key to decrypt that. And generally speaking, there's a public key ring. And if you have a Mac, you actually know this. You have a, this all built into the uh, Apple Mac OS X. You have this key ring software, but there's, there's also key ring software for Windows and so on, where you can store all these public keys in a nice spot so all programs can use them to decrypt these messages and verify the senders and so on. So um, <coughs> if I... Some of you have had my emails and it has this nice begin PGP block thingy in there. So what is that? Any guesses on what it means and what it is used for? Probably your key. What? It's probably your key. No, it's not my key. Exactly the, the wrong answer in this case, sorry. So what is this PG blah 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 begin PGP block 
thingy you will have seen in my emails. Is this maybe a string that is encrypted and if you use the correct key it decrypts to something logical? Or that it knows it's the correct? It's, it's not that the message itself is not encrypted. You can no, read it no, without the... The string, the random... What is it used for? Uh, to decrypt... Uh, yeah, there is no decryption going on, so it's not decryption in that case. Yes? Clarify if it's actually you. Yes, it, that is the signing that is going on, the signing part that I mentioned previously. So if you have one of these emails from me, and it says begin PGP, uh, usually it's called begin PGP sign block or whatever, um, and you have my public key and you have the appropriate software, obviously, um, it will recognize this and it will give a green, hopefully a green, bar if you trust me or it will be a gray part bar if it's in most clients to indicate it matches but you haven't actually trusted this person yet this verification that's really in, uh, uh, relevant right now but then it will interpret this to see if the this block of information this signing information matches the sender the message etc that's what's going on Does everyone understand that? So the encryption thing is not really that different, it's just a PGP encrypted block and it's, uh, then the actual message is encrypted as well, but the whole principle behind it, where it is the public key that you have and I encrypted the message using my private key, the same kind of thing goes on, but it's not just the signing, it's also the encryption in that case. It does both. There are many uh, different ways of doing this, public key crypt cryptography. Um, RSA, still in widespread use. Um, RSA 4096 is a bit, is, a, is, is at, uh, at this time the uh, recommended size. Um, but there are some strong, uh, once again, there are some uh, cryptographers who are uh, strongly voicing uh, concerns about continuing to use this because RSA is becoming uh, well within the realm of brute forcing as well, especially at smaller key sizes. Uh, Diffie Hellman, um, you won't, uh, I've never seen it in practice, neither DSS. Uh, elliptic curve is uh, often uh, touted as the uh, successor to RSA, but much like with symmetric encryption, as, we, uh, as I spoke about uh, of, uh, previously, you have this problem of existing infrastructure that needs to be transitioned to support all these new forms of, uh, these new algorithms, new forms of encryption and so on. So it will take time. Ideally, of course, you have something that says yes in all columns, but I think that speaks for itself. So these are the requirements for public key crypto. Um, Computationally easy to create key pairs. This is, of course, um, very important because the more complex this is and the more intensive uh, this process is, if you need to do this a lot, and depending on uh, what you're doing, you might need to do this a lot, it can really slow down matters. And time is money. <coughs> it also equally needs to be computationally easy to do the encryption and decryption, et cetera, et cetera. And this has some inherent effects. If it's computationally easy, there's also the problem, um, it's a trade-off. If it's computationally easy to do this, it is also computationally easy, likewise and similarly, to start brute forcing, brute forcing things. So there's always a trade-off between these two. And this is two sides of the same coin, for that matter, computationally infeasible. So a lot of work goes into finding algorithms that do this, but are extremely good at this as well. And that's why they're looking at elliptic curve for several reasons, specifically 21559. You can feel free to look that up again. Um, and of course, what, is, what does uh, this uh, blurb mean? We've actually dealt with it before. In other, uh, uh, there were other examples of this. Okay. Hmm? Of data. This is not uh, different from uh, the uh, problem of known 
plain text, the text, etc. You want the algorithm itself needs to be, uh, the output it generates needs to be as random as possible. It needs to look truly random, complete garbage to someone, so that they can't guess what was actually be, make an educated guess of what it was that was being transmitted. Okay, um, so this is called asymmetric encryption. And these are the uh, examples. Elliptic curve is at the bottom. I don't know what the uh, length of these things is supposed to mean. RSA is alt. And um, <coughs> the problem with RSA is that it, uh, uh, because it's alt and it's uh, not necessarily, uh, um, because of the way it works, let's put it like that, um, there are some inherent problems with RSA. Which uh, normally you would say, well, this is the key size, 1024 bit key size, that's enormous. But because of the way RSA works, there are some inherent weaknesses that really help you to narrow down the search space when you're doing things. And this is why they're looking at things like elliptic, elliptic curve. So, um, digital signatures. <coughs> so, this is what I meant with the other part of. <coughs> <laughs> Seems legit, bro. Yeah, I like to include memes in my presentation. Um, the whole point of digital signatures is the authentication part. But in authentication implies two things <coughs> in this case. It also implies that the data integrity has been maintained, that the message has not been altered. In other words, that it can't be changed in transit uh, for whatever reason or uh, it has otherwise been tampered with. So when you, once again, once you get this email from me that says begin PGP blah blah blah, sign block and there's the message in between and all this uh, something looking like garbage, random data at the bottom, uh, there's also some medical space calculations going on that allow this software to determine whether the message is the message that it's supposed to be, that it hasn't been tampered with. So sometimes I get... Um, Funnily enough, sometimes students reply to this email and they put their, they leave everything in there, the begin PGP sign block and uh, there's my email and then there's this whole garbage looking thing, but they give me inline comments in this block, inline replies. They, uh, there's a question in there and they answer that question and they send the email back to me. And what happens then? I get this large nice red bar in my mail client that says invalid PGP signature because the PGP block has been altered because you started to include replies in there. So the message, the original message has been altered and the accompanying block does no longer match it. So you will see things like that. Okay, so... Um, Do remember, much like this PGP sign block example, once again, it's a very practical example, but you've all seen it by now, so, it's, it, it's, uh, so I can refer to it. It is not confidentiality. And you know this, because if you receive this email and you forward to someone else, it's, it's not even about you receiving it, or anyone that is in between and that intercepts the message, they can read it. It's just there in plain text still, the original message. There's no confidentiality whatsoever. That comes from the encryption <coughs> part. And that's called, it's safe from alteration but not from eavesdropping therefore. <coughs> so, uh, public key certificate use, <coughs> this is the same uh, story as uh, uh, previously um, with uh, Bob and Alice exchanging information so not too much uh, I'm not going to completely repeat it. <coughs> so, um, signatures, and uh, usually this is done with uh, certificate authorities that sign, you, you do a request, you get a certificate, and this, uh, there's a public and private key system there as well. You have uh, your certificate with your uh, private key. Uh, you, the public key is public use, and how this exactly works, uh, once again, Oscar gets into more detail. It's not in these slides. But um, some student actually came forward and asked about this. And the whole idea of these cer cer uh, certificate authorities that are in there, 
is that um, there's a system where they can issue these certificates. They derive them from their own public private key infrastructure. So yeah, the details come later. And the idea is that because we all have these certificate authorities, they're in your browser store, they're in your windows, they're in your operating system usually, we have this list of certificate authorities, we can verify or basically we have a third party confirming that I am really who I say I am based on that certificate that was signed by the certificate authority. That's the idea. And if you think about it, that's the same with how HTTPS works. You go to the certificate authority, you hand them this certificate request, which is, it has some information, they sign it, and that is really the act of them, okay, we've verified that it's you, that you're asking for some, for you're doing a legitimate request, the seems legit thing, okay, we believe that, and because the certificate authority has then verified it, they give you the signed certificate, signed by them, you can offer that in your browser to host a website, let's say, for instance, and when people visit this website, because they have in their own operating system, browser or whatever, this same root certificate authority, they can do this verification process. They can see, okay, this person was verified by the certificate authority, okay, the names match, etc. Lots of things go on in the background to verify it. Did you have a question? No? Is it possible to perform a man in the middle attack and access a CDA? No. In theory, everything is possible, but if you do that, then your uh, implementation is incorrect. If you do things properly, you cannot man in the middle this. That's, that would be the, that would de defeat the whole purpose. The whole purpose of this is that you want to be sure. The whole purpose of this system is, is preventing tampering and alteration and providing secrecy. So if you could do this, then it, there would be no use for PKI. That is to say, if the implementation is done correctly. There are some, there are, but um, it's, it's very difficult for me now to go into, uh, to, to explain why this is without going into tons of detail. And Oscar is already covering this next week. But in general, no. If it is done correctly, there is no man in the middle possible. So when these, stu uh, just to finish my point, when these students were in the news, they went to some, I think, the Folia web or something. Look, we can intercept uh, wireless at the HVA and it's super insecure and whatever. And I looked at their implementation and it was, clearly they didn't understand how PKI actually worked. And the claims were uh, completely bogus claims. They were depending on end users being stupid as well. Completely stupid and not verifying anything. And that's really what, I'm, uh, what, what my point is. If the implementation is incorrect, that is to say, if you allow people to be stupid and not realize this, and it's easy to detect this properly, that there's, being, that there's tampering going on, then the implementation should be improved. So even if I were to act like CI, like stand between the verification between the end user and the You can't. You can't act like a CA, that's the whole point. No, no, it's a, if, even then, I would immediately be aware that you're trying to do this. The thing is, there is no, uh, there are two things, uh, two limitless things. It's the size of the universe and human stupidity. Some, Einstein said something like that, and he wasn't sure about the uh, former, about the uh, universe. Um, the problem um, is that if someone is stupid enough to install something into their trust store, as it's called, as a certificate authority, and if you follow the news, you've read, read about this with the Superfish debacle, for instance, or the Commodia thing, those are things that install themselves as certificate authorities. That is to say, if you purposely accept someone as a certificate authority, all bets are off. But that's, once again, that's still just human stupidity in installing that. You can't protect against that. 
there is a limit to what you can do. Uh, I mean, uh, at one point, a user can always defeat this through his or her own, own wrongdoing. Malware frequently does this in general. They will install a certificate authority into the operating system's trust store so they can man in the middle the traffic that goes to the uh, uh, banking usually. It's usually banking trojans at least. So they can eavesdrop on this. But if it's done, if the implementation is correct, this is not possible. Um, there's also the idea of digital envelopes, which is, um, <coughs> I won't go into much de too much detail. Um, it basically comes down to uh, having secrecy in this case, sealing the envelope. You need to unseal it before you can read it. So in this case, there is secrecy. And uh, what they... Uh, uh, The intent of this is, is uh, summarized neatly. Um, the point is, is that in this case, you don't need to share the secret key beforehand. So this is all still based on PKI. And you know this because this is what happens when you uh, visit a website, a secure website. There is also encryption going on and you don't actually know the secret key. Part of the HTTPS is the S, the SSL part or TLS these days, where this <coughs> setting up of the encrypted part goes on. Okay, so I already said something about random numbers. Um, the, the thing is, if you do encryption, you want to have a good random number generator because you need to randomly choose this secret key that you're going, or one or more secret keys actually, that you're going to use for encryption and decryption. And the better your random number generator is, the less likely it is that someone will be able to guess or start to predict what the secret key is, etc., etc. So, um, and this is used a lot, therefore, random number generation. There's, you, you simply have no other uh, um, way of getting randomness. You need some form of random number generator. Um, <coughs> and a good random number generator does this. Let's say we have a key space of uh, 1,000 possible keys. If we do a million <coughs> random number generators, we do that a, a million times, we will have each of these 1,000 keys exactly 1,000 times. 1,000 times 1,000 is a, a million again. A uniform distribution. That's what you want. Because if it isn't uniform distribution, it implies that there is some predictability. If one number would start randomly appearing more often, that's risky. And this is, uh, this is really for the statisticians, which I am not. Uh, there's also independence. No one value in the sequence can be inferred from the others. That is to say, there is no relation between two iterations of using the random number generator. So if the um, you can have a random number generator that does 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, until it reaches 1,000, and then it does 1, 3, 5. Then you still have a completely uniform distribution, but it is very easy to predict what the next value will be. So each number is statistically independent of other numbers in the sequence, and you should not be able to predict this, this uh, sequence of events. Um, uh, uh, if it's not obvious now, it's hard to do this. It's extremely difficult to have true run random number generation. <coughs> so, true randomness is hard. Most, uh, there's a lot of pseudo random number generations. Um, <coughs> because those are easier to acquire. Pseudo random number generators, generally, um, they, it looks like they're, I would almost say, random enough. They suffice for normal use. <coughs> but the problem is, uh, if you assume that uh, there's the assumption, or rather the uh, little nagging feeling and the knowledge that it, there are probably some 
predictable things in there. It's, it's difficult. Um, true random number generators, um, they do exist. And luckily, they're becoming more common on uh, processors, etc. And you can get them in hardware. Um, I was actually at a recent lecture by Daniel Bernstein and Tanya Lange about this, where they talked about this. Uh, true random number genera generation is not that hard because we can just listen to noise coming from the rest of the universe. You're never going to be able to predict what comes out from there. Um, but you can imagine that it's not that easy to start building that into uh, every computer, uh, every device, etc. So that, there's a practicality question. Luckily it is provided on uh, modern processors. They have this kind of uh, hardware on them that gives you true random number generation. But the problem with this is still you are trusting that the manufacturer in that case did things correctly as well. There's also that problem. Did, they, did Intel really do it correctly? Um, so this is, a, this is actually a big challenge in cryptography and uh, the, the problem with uh, the Debian example was that they, the random number generator that was used was bad at the time. So they had to revoke a lot of stuff. Okay, um, so other practical application, encryption of stored data. Um, I already gave the example of a, a full disk encryption. Um, you won't see it as much uh, for uh, stored data. Um, and that's mostly because if you're doing backups and archiving, it can be quite undesirable to do this. Especially if it's intend intended for data recovery purposes or disaster recovery. If you start encrypting everything, it assumes that you haven't lost the keys, for instance. But it's also not that desirable to start storing the keys everywhere. That's also a risk. So usually it's easier to have the data stored somewhere in a very secure facility, but in an unencrypted form. You will see solutions like that. Um, is anyone actually using a full disk encryption here? Not that many, actually. Um, you will see it a lot there. That, that's the whole point, basically. Um, it's actually mandatory in many companies, and uh, most uh, uh, important government organizations also mandate the use of full disk encryption. And that's, uh, well, we've all seen the news once again. You've seen this whole s uh, series of uh, reports over the uh, years of USB keys being left behind, laptops being stolen from cars. And if the data on there would be unencrypted, uh, the impact could be quite huge if it contains sensitive data. Okay. Um, so, um, it's the last slide in summary. <coughs> Symmetric encryption is mostly about confidentiality and public key infrastructure does both. It's used for both. Um, a lot of the quality of uh, encryption, uh, uh, what the effectiveness is of the encryption, hinges on random number generation. And if you haven't uh, uh, looked into this, also once again, I recommend reading up a lot on this for the coming lecture by Oscar, so you come well prepared. Um, and uh, particularly, I would recommend looking at the, uh, uh, like the Debian example I gave you, and um, also the PlayStation 4, how it was hacked and why it is now a fully, sorry, the PlayStation 3, my mistake, uh, why the PlayStation 3 is a completely hacked and open system now. That's also a good example of uh, how not to do random number generation. Um, okay, so I would like to ask, uh, in summary, I mean, it, it's quite obvious, are there any questions about today's lecture? Yes? Yes. It doesn't make sense because 
No. Why should AES uh, come out when... Uh, skip, 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 skip. It's a proposal for a new advanced encryption standard. AES is the... Okay. Wasn't the, the actual name then. And they selected Rijndaal, the Rijndaal algorithm, to become the successor in 2001. It I don't understand why should they come when this wasn't uh, hacked by that time. Because um, the, the point is, is that even then they knew that brute force decryption of DES was around the corner for the average computer user. Yeah. Which meant that a lot of communications were at risk becoming at risk of being intercepted. And of course interception in this case means that also someone could inspect, modify and, and not, not just man in the middle and sniff but also alter the data and encrypt it again to make it look like legitimate data which is even worse. <coughs> so they knew that it was coming this problem and EFF Announced in '98 because they knew this was this was uh, this problem was becoming a real-world problem, brute force decryption. EFF proved that that was true, a real problem, by successfully doing that in '98. And there have actually been, uh, um, uh, I think, most of you are familiar with the things like uh, Boeing and uh, SETI at home and so on. And they there used to be these uh, similar things before we had all those, where it was about cracking encryption, seeing if it was feasible to brute force RC4, RC5, and so on. Cryptographic hashing algorithms, and that has been proven to be, uh, that has proven to be quite uh, realistic as well. In real world to do that, breaking those hashing functions. So, does that answer your question? Okay, any other questions? Yes? All certificates expire for that reason. That's a very good question. I, I, I don't. Well, once again, I don't want to steal too much of Oscar's glory, but all certificates have to expire at some reason. Uh, sorry, at some time, uh, and for some reason, actually, either their time has expired or they've been compromised in some way or other, or they need to be revoked. In that case, um, so the answer, yeah, the answer is yes. That needs to happen, and they need to be reissued. There needs to be a new uh, certificate issued, even for the root certificates, with a new duration. And then everyone needs to have that new certificate. And if you, um, if you look at, uh, if you're a Windows user and you look at the detailed information in the Windows updates, every once in a while you will see that certain certificates get added or removed. And if you're using Linux, your, your particular flavor of Linux, you will also see that these updates sometimes remove or add new certificates, root certificates or intermediate certificates even. So yes, that needs to be done. So, and, and the problem is, is that a lot of uh, the trust we have completely hinges on the certificate authorities doing their job properly. And that's a, quite a big risk and it's pr been proven to be, uh, uh, well, it's, it's proven to be uh, bad or unwarranted our trust. Look at DigiNotar, or there have been issues with certificate authorities in the past, intentional or unintentional. The system has come under a lot of criticism in the recent years because of this. Okay, any other questions? Okay, then. Yeah, sure. No, you don't have to know these exact numbers by heart, but if you, if you know how many keys there are, this is something you could easily calculate yourself. If you know how many calculations per second you can do, yeah. key calculations, and you know how many keys there are, you can just divide the two, and you know how much time there is. It's, the last column is just a question of this number, 
and the number of keys. Knowing those two. It looks worse than it is. So no, you don't have to know them by heart, but yes, you need to be able to do a simple division. <laughs> More questions? Okay, then I wish you a lot of uh, reading up and luck and enjoyment with the uh, lecture and workshops.